Okay, um, again, welcome back to uh, our last panel uh, of this conference. Um, the panel is called Refugees, Exclusion and Citizenship, and I think we go back to the real core of, uh, of why we are here and uh, the refugees and citizens uh, in uh, and the new nation states in Europe at that time. We'll have uh, five speeches now. We'll, we said on the uh, paper that we'll start with Michael Frankl, then Alina Bote, Benjamin Naukos, and then Ms. Brandl, and then Ms. Babisch. We do have uh, a little change now because Alina Bote, as you might have seen already, couldn't make it uh, to Vienna. She's here via Skype, and that's why we'll start with her. Uh, have a few questions and, uh, and a small round for answers as well then and then we'll continue with the other fours um, afterwards. Uh, let me just uh, introduce Alina Bote very, very quickly. Um, Alina Bote studied history, politics and Eastern European uh, history at the Freie Universität Berlin. Uh, from 2012 to 15, she was a research fellow at the Center for Jewish Studies in Berlin, Brandenburg as well. And uh, she has a big range of uh, of uh, interests and uh, studies uh, in digital humanities, gender studies, Shoah history and contemporary history. Uh, and her postdoc research project deals with the persecution of Polish Jews in the German Reich between October 38 and September 1939. And that brings us also to her speech today about the Polish Jewish deportees in 1938 and the Polen Um Alina, you have the word. Thank you. Um, I'm very sorry it happened what I feared that it would happen because I can't hear you any longer and um, most what I can see is pixels. Um, if you could just give me a sign, a thumb up uh, or anything, if you can still hear me. Okay, now then I will progress now with, with my paper and I hope you can hear me or otherwise let me know if this is not working. I'm, I'm sorry for that. Um, first of all, I would like to express my gratitude for being invited to this workshop and furthermore for being unable to be there virtually via Skype uh, as I can't travel as you heard due to an injury. Um, I know myself that Skype connections during a conference tend to be instable as we just see now and I appreciate that you took the extra stress and work that came with my question. Due to being only virtually there, I could not prepare a PowerPoint presentation so that the logistics of my presentation do not become too complicated. My paper today, as you've just heard, stems from my postdoc project, which started to develop during the last two years. But I, as I was finishing um, my PhD parallel to this, um, it's still early in the project and I'm looking forward to your thoughts and comments. After these preliminary notes, I would like to start directly with my paper. On October 28, 1938, National Socialist politics once again shaped and changed European discourse and the lives of many people. This time, they focused on citizenship and expulsion. Nazi politics forced many international actors to respond again and to refocus their conception of what was happening in Europe at this time. On October 28, 1938, marks the first mass deportation of National Socialism and started a year-long policy of enforced persecution of Jews with Polish passports in the German Reich. I will discuss the Polen Aktion as this persecution was called by the perpetrators in this paper as a crucial shift in the European discourse and politics on statehood and asylum in the important year of 1938. Raphael Gross has recently pointed out why 1938 is a year of many shifts in the persecution of Jews. I quote, the year 38 stands for a new dimension of violence against Jews, for the transformation from discrimination and deprivation of rights to systematic persecution, robbery and eviction. Quote Ed. Concerning my field of research here, I claim that 1938 is also relevant for persecution concerning the legal status of citizenship, especially of a foreign citizenship. 
The main question will be how different agents in the field understood those who were deported as refugees or in Yiddish as Arroisgeschichte, deportees. My paper today will have the following structure. First of all, I'll give a short introduction about the persecution of Jews with Polish citizenship in the German Reich, 1938 to 39. Thereby, I will rely on the already done intense research on the deportations from Berlin. Second, I'll sketch some theoretical thoughts on the topic. Before third, I have a close look on the standpoints of different Polish and international agents. The first Polen action was the gathering, arrest and deportation of more than 15,000 Jews of Polish citizenship to Poland under the pretense of the Polish March laws. From late January onwards until August 1939, an estimated number of another 15,000 was deported in small roundups. In September 39, finally more than 3,000 Jewish men with Polish passports were arrested and sent to the concentration camps of Sachsenhausen, Buchenwald and Dachau. There had been expulsions of Eastern European Jewish migrants from Germany beforehand, most notably in 1921 and 1923. But 1938 was in quantity as well as in quality singular in its dimensions. The events between October 38 and September 39 <clears throat> are key to understanding the escalation of events and the radicalization of anti-Jewish politics. The first Polen action proved the possibilities of the movement of population, especially towards the East. The second Polen Aktion was the first concentration camp action against this group of the population and showed the newly gained powers of water in German life. Following the German annexing of Austria, the same passed the law on citizenship, the so-called March laws. Citizens who lived abroad and had not re-entered Poland in minimum the last five years could be stripped of the citizenship. The law was neutral in language, but it was clearly aiming at the Polish Jews living in Austria and Germany. Polish politicians had been afraid of mass immigration of pauperized Jewish migrants who lost their property in the Reich and annexed territories. The law had already been prepared since October 1937 in the consular section headed by Viktor Tomedrima, otherwise it could not have been processed this fast as Jerzy Tomaszewski argues convincingly. Mixing anti-Semitic and economic arguments, the same as well as the Polish government was interested in stopping a possible mass immigration of Jews with Polish citizenship from Austria and the German Reich. By revoking the citizenship, this aim should be secured. After an extensive exchange of notes in which the Reich demanded the revocation of the March laws, the Ausländerpolizeiverordnung, regulation of the police's handlings of foreigners, was inert on August 22, 1938 for the German Reich. In Article 4, Section 1, B and C, it stated, and I quote, the resident permit expires when the foreign alien is no longer possess a valid according to the passport regulations required passport or passport substitute, if the foreign alien loses or changes his nationality. If the Jews of Polish citizenship living in Germany would have the citizenship revoked by the Polish administration following the March laws, they would have the resident permit for the Reich revoked at, as well at the same moment. Some of the later deportees realized the danger of the new Polish and German laws and regulations very early and tried hard to emigrate, as we know from their letters and testimonies. On October 6, 1938, the Polish Ministry of Interior sent out a new regulation setting the March laws into effect. If the Polish Jews permanently living abroad were not able to receive a visa stamped into their passports until the 30th of the month, their citizenship would be revoked. The regulation was published about a fortnight later, making it practically impossible for most affected to follow the regulation and receive the visa stamps. 
For the German side, this was the pretense to set the already prepared mass deportation into effect. On October 26, 1938, Reichsführer SS and Chief of German Police in the Reich, Heinrich Himmler, gave the order for the mass deportation to the subordinated authorities of the Reich. Between October 27th and 29th, the affected persons were arrested in the whole Reich, in their homes as well as on the streets, brought to collection points and from there on transferred in regular trains in non-regular service towards the Polish border. Most of the trains from all over Germany went to Neubensch and Sponginek, from where the deportees were forced to march towards the Polish border. The German guards acted very violently on this last part of the deportation. The deportees were beaten, forced to run, and many lost their little baggage and possessions on this march. Max Kapp wrote to a member of family about this in November 38. I quote, as we had some invalids with us, we had to drag them along. The police units accompanying us had rifles and bayonets fixed, quote end. At the Polish border, the deputies were forced at gunpoint to cross into no man's land. Oftentimes, the Polish border guards tried to prevent this. The deportation stopped on October 29, 38, because Poland had threatened to expel, expel ethnic Germans from Poland. Those already deported had to stay in Poland many thousands in the border town of Spongy, to which Saul Friedlander refers as an internment camp. What we can see here is the brutal chapter of a binational conflict about the citizenship of a minority. Meanwhile, the Polish state was not interested in having Polish Jews migrating and some of them re-migrating to Poland. The Polish embassy in Berlin intervened regularly on behalf of the Polish Jews in Germany from 1933 onwards. But it seems to be no coincidence that Ambassador Lipsky was not in Berlin at the end of October 1938. As it has been written beforehand, in refugee politics, the 1930s were a special decade. Matthew Frank and Jessica Reinisch put it like this, and I quote, the decades saw coordination between states to guard against refugees a negative form of international cooperation based on a sort of competitive restrictionism, quote, and. Michael Franke stated the following for the Czechoslovakian case, but it is strikingly close to the Polish situation, and I quote him, the refugees in question became increasingly intertwined with citizenship, ethnicity, and minority rights. Refugee politics are a helpful lens in discussing the first so-called Polen Aktion, but am I really talking about refugees here? I've used different words so far to describe those affected by the first mass deportation. Turning to Arya Tatakova and Kurt Grossman's Jewish refugee from 1944 helps to differentiate. Following Tatakova and Grossman, there are three different groups of people who leave their countries of origin. First, emigrants who decide voluntarily to move into another country. Second, refugees, whom they describe, I quote, as a refugee is a person who leaves his place of abode, not of his own free will, but because he is driven to do so by fear of persecution or by actual persecution, on account of his race, religion, or political conventions, quote, and, or third, deportees. And uh, once again, Tartakova and Grossman are to be quoted here. All traces of voluntarism in, is lost in the case of the third category of displaced people, the deportees. These are persons compelled by physical force to leave their homes and go elsewhere. They are free neither to choose the time of their departure, nor, with very few except, exceptions, to go wherever they like. As a rule, both the emigration and their new place of residence are fixed for them by the deporting authorities. Quote end. They add that a deportation is mostly accompanied by the confiscation of property. Given these defining aspects of the deportee, as someone was, I quote, compelled by physical force 
to leave their home and go elsewhere, quote, and I would argue one could safely assume those brought to the Polish border in October 1938 were deportees. But turning to Tartakova and Grossman, the picture is confused when they are analyzing the first mass deportation. First, they write about the Poland Aktion, I quote, on the night of October 28, 1938, over 15,000 Polish Jews, long resident in Germany, were arrested and deported to Poland, quote end. Someone who's deported is a deportee. A few sentences later, we can read the following, and I quote again, at first, the Polish authorities allowed the refugees to proceed to the interior, where they could at least expect to receive temporary help from friends or relatives. But a few days later, the authorities had a change of heart and interned over 5,000 refugees at Spongin. Quote, and now we have refugees who were deported and are subsequently interned. This little semantic analysis, to my understanding, shows that as in 1938, as well as in 1944, when Tartakova and Grossman wrote their book, the legal and political situation of the victims were hard to grasp. They were literally what Sybil Milton once called people between borders. Sometimes a shift can be recognized immediately, sometimes it is reconstructed retrospectively. Turning to my case study here, I would now like to discuss three examples of wording and naming the deportees by different agents involved. Very different agents were involved in the persecution of Jews with Polish citizenship on different levels. I will now look on the description of the affected or the victims by three of these agents. First, the German Foreign Ministry. Second, two different Polish Jewish organizations and third, the international joint. For the German foreign ministry, the situation was complicated. I think we've lost her. Alina, can you hear me? No, she's Hello, Alina. Hello. Oh, it, it works again. <laughs> good, Great. To, good to have you back. <laughs> All right. I think we'll try again and, and just continue where you've stopped or where the computer has stopped you. Okay. I, I was just giving you the three examples. First, the German Foreign Ministry. Second, two different Polish-Jewish organizations. And third, the international joint on their different uh, wording. And I just have two um, short paragraphs, um, and then I'll have this paper finished. So um, for the German Foreign Ministry, the situation was complicated. Meanwhile, the Ministry of Interior wanted to expel the Austrian as soon as possible. They had it for a diplomatic option without showing signs of weakness towards, German or, towards other German authorities. The language they chose was bureaucratic. They spoke about Polish nationals, Polish Jewish nationals, or Polish nationals of Jewish race. Right after the deportation, they changed the wording and further spoke about Polish Jews who were the property of the Polish state and about ex-police. Two Polish Jewish committees were set up immediately to help those who were deported. The major one, headed by Chief Rabbi Moshe Shor, responded to the situation by raising money for the play team, the Yiddish term for refugees. Meanwhile, a second organization close to the Bund, the Arbeiterhilfskomitee für die Arreusgeschichten von Deutschland, one of the key figures was Emanuel Ringelblum, used the term Arreusgeschichte, Yiddish for deportees. The American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee said in their description an example that was six years later followed by Tartakova and Grossman, refugees who were deported. I think we can discuss if the Poland Aktion as the first major large-scale expulsion or better deportation as a turning point in refugee politics, as the victims of this persecution were no longer refugees in the classical sense. The Poland Aktion was made possible 
through the context of the emerging nation states after the First World War and the accompanying laws on citizenship. The coming to terms, which I've just briefly analyzed, describes a difficult political and legal situation which hints to the shift that I've stated in my introductory remarks. The victims of the first mass deportation were stateless citizens of Poland, refugees in their country on, of citizenship, deportees from the country of living. Closing this paper, I would like to draw your attention to the other early deportations, like in the Burgenland and Sudetenland, which were different in shape and quantity, but nevertheless, and towards the shift that happens in 1938. There are important aspects in which the persecution of Polish Jews in Germany is distinct from the other persecutions and expulsions mentioned. But as we discuss in this workshop, or better you and I'm just um, in here very shortly and virtually, within a European framework, it seems important to me to broaden the context. Further on, we need to include the second Polen Aktion, which I just mentioned briefly, um, and which has not been researched enough. But for Berlin, I can state that between September 13th and 16th, 1939, more than 600 men were arrested and transferred to Sachsenhausen concentration camp, where they had their own barracks. Preliminary research shows that about 50% of them were dead by March 1940. While the men deported in the same action from Vienna, more than 1,300 to Buchenwald, we can state that 27 of them were still alive in 1945. Their status was no longer one of deportees. Meanwhile, many of them were deported in October 38, but of prisoners in the concentration camp system. And with this, I close. Thank you very much for your attention and for bearing with me to, during the technical mishaps. Thank you, Lina. <clears throat> Thank you for your very interesting paper. Uh, I think we would have uh, dealt with the second and the third freezing of the computer because it was so interesting. Thank you very much. Um, I think in many ways it goes to the core of this uh, uh, of this whole uh, symposium that we're having here um, and uh, some of the questions uh, um, I think uh, that you mentioned uh, we have been mentioned already beforehand and uh, I think many people will be very interesting to have uh, some questions here so I'll just uh, ask you to yeah Pila. I have a question um, um, you said um somewhere at the end that uh, the German foreign minister regarded the deportees or whatever, they, they were Polish, uh, no, they were, I don't know, whatever, citizens uh, with property of the Polish state. Was the Polish state ever interested in getting this property in any way? Because we have a case, or we have a case here in, in Austria that there were Hungarian forced laborers and uh, the state of Hungary was never interested in the, in the lives of these Hungarian forced laborers, but the moment they got to know that the forced laborers died or were deported, they, um, um, they wanted to get hold of their property here in Vienna. Is there a similar case of what happened? What does this Polish state do with the property of these people? Um, that, that's something very interesting. Thank you for the question, because I think uh, it, it still confuses more the question if they are deportees or refugees. Um, turning into, once again, Polish citizens. What happens is that um, a Polish-German um, Council of Negotiations is formed immediately in November 38, and it results in a Polish-German declaration on, the, on January 24, 39, that most of the property of those who were deported is to be transferred to Poland but it needs to be sold first in Germany, and then um, the money needs to be exchanged through, through um, a special bank account. So yes, Poland is very interested in getting the property of these Polish nationals into Poland. Thank you. Um, any further questions or remarks? 
Yes, please. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. It's, I think it's 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 a uh, it's it's a fascinating fascinating topic. Just a question of facts. Could you please say a word about uh, about these fifteen thousand to six no seventeen thousand Jews who were expelled in the first in the first action in the Poland action? How many had lost their Polish citizenship, and how many were still Polish citizens? Uh, could you say a word about that? I think they were a lot of them had 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 lost their citizenship because of the March March edicts, March laws. But how many of them? Uh, this is an important question for the question of statelessness and whether they had to be taken back by the by the Polish state. They would have lost uh, their status on the 30th of October, so they were deported one to two days beforehand. How many of them were really in danger of uh, losing the statehood? Can't be said now. Um, we are still missing the, the important data on this because um, most of the, um, the files from the Polish embassy did not, uh, is not existing any longer. But uh, what I can say is that uh, the German foreign ministry and uh, ministry of interior uh, was afraid that most of them would lose their nationality, uh, their state, sorry. Thanks. Further questions? No further questions. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Alina, uh, for for your really interesting paper. Um, so we'll try to keep you on the line now. So do you stay with us? And exactly. I'll switch off the microphone now. So I will be just <laughs> okay. listening. Okay, great. Perhaps we, if if that all works, perhaps we can talk to you later. So we'll see. Uh, Would be lovely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Diese Verschärfung der Flüchtlingskrise bringt uns jetzt zum nächsten Referenten. So I'm introducing Michael Frankl to you now. I think I don't have to introduce uh, you, Michael Frankl, too much anymore. Most of you uh, will know him anyway. He's at the moment still the deputy director and head of the Department of Jewish Studies at the uh, uh, History of Antisemitism at the Jewish Museum in Prague. Uh, he uh, is a number of uh, several books, uh, especially uh, about the refugee situation in Czechoslovakia in the interwar uh, period, as well as about anti-Semitism in Czech Republic and uh, the Czech lands in the 19th and early 20th century. In 2015, he was a visiting fellow at the Czech Joseph and Morton Mandel Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies at the, at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. Michael. Thank you, Wolfgang, for the kind introduction. I apologize for all the technical complications, um, and especially because my paper connects very well to Alina's, who I hope is still with us. Um, and that's why I'll bring you right back to the no man's land. Um, and <laughs> um, this is a photo made by a journalist, probably a French journalist, at the end of October 1938. Um, that captures a group of Jewish refugees from Sudetenland languishing somewhere uh, in the no man's land between the Czechoslovak and German border guards, allegedly roughly 150 uh, people uh, who were living on the new demarcation line as it was drawn in consequence of the Munich uh, Agreement uh, at the end of September uh, 1938. Um, this this is just one of many um, many uh, instances of the no man's land on the uh, on the new uh, German Czechoslovak border. Um, and to illustrate this, um, let me just give you uh, um, a quick a quick quotation from a report of a Czechoslovak official uh, ma um, report made just after the Kristallnacht from uh, Western Bohemia. Uh, this is a report which, by the way, is also very interesting for the uh, vocabulary that is being used there. Uh, the report reads, um, um, uh, the Jew Walter Korn and his concubine Františka Fridova, displaced from Nechtiny to our territory, are still located at the road next to the Reich's German customs gate. 
Um, they are supported by their co-religionists from Magnetin. Uh, furniture of these emigrants was still stored at the carriages of the farmers from Nechtiny. And then the report goes on uh, to say, to describe how uh, against the will of the refugees, this furniture was offloaded into the ditch uh, by the German officials so that the carriages can be taken away by their owners. Um, following this, a German official explained to his Czech counterpart that the German government, uh, quote, doesn't recognize uh, any citizenship of Jews, and that they are considered foreigners without regard to their domicile, end quote. Um, what is being drawn here is not um, just the new border uh, of the smaller, humiliated, nationalist, and, as we know, anti-Semitic Czechoslovakia, uh, but also a new frontier within the body of inhabitants, or a new definition of citizenship, um, because those who now lingered between the lines um, were not foreigners in any common sense, uh, but they were, at least up to September 1938, and in many ways uh, afterwards, um, they were Czechoslovak citizens. Uh, the aim of my paper is to probe this, the relationship between refugee policy um, and citizenship in a, uh, in a nation state. And uh, to do this, I will especially uh, focus on a particular uh, crisis moment um, in which the refugee is perceived as the ultimate ultimate uh, non-citizen. Um, um, the point of departure for my analysis is the recognition that uh, that the uh, that the uh, terms of citizen and refugee are complementary categories um, that both are underpinned by mechanisms of uh, in and exclusion and that the refugee is very often understood as the very antipode of a of a citizens that's why confrontations about refugees or about migration generally uh, these are confrontations uh, debates about citizenship the nature of citizenship the logic of citizenship um, itself um, my research is, um, or the case I'm presenting here is part of a broader research project called Citizens of the No Man's Land, which examines the relationship between the shift towards restrictive refugee policies in East Central Europe at the end of 1930s and the changes of understanding of citizenship. The uh, factual core of my research are four large-scale expulsions of Jews from Austria after, uh, after uh, the Anschluss, from Sudetenland after the Munich Agreement, from, uh, from Slovakia into southern Slovakia after the, after the first Vienna Award, as well as the uh, expulsion of Polish Jews from Germany, about which we have already, uh, already heard. Um, To illustrate this, I have, um, uh, just as an illustration of this broader context, uh, um, I can show you a map uh, with several instances, but by far not all of the documented instances of uh, Jewish refugees who are stranded in the no man's land sometime in 1938. Um, um, I think it is interesting that uh, even though this um, this topic is uh, relatively well known, or at least some cases are relatively well known, uh, so far there has ne there hasn't been comparative um, research into these expulsions and this proliferation of the uh, of the no man's land. Um, however, in order for us to understand what has happened in the Czechoslovak refugee policy. Uh, we need, I need to take you a, a little bit back. Um, and apparently the story of um, uh, refugees from Germany or from Austria, as illustrated by Wolfgang's paper earlier today, this story doesn't start with closed borders, nor does it start with ethnic uh, categories. Yet, um, refugees in Czechoslovakia, um, uh, we know that Czechoslovakia uh, was a relatively important place of refuge for German and Austrian refugees. Um, and although exact numbers are not known, we can assume, uh, we can assume that some uh, 20,000 um, German refugees uh, at least temporarily uh, stayed in Czechoslovakia after, 1930, um, uh, after 1933. Yet, in contradiction to the 
uh, rather established myths and beautifications, um, Czechoslovakia was a rather imperfect place of refuge. And I do not have time to go into this. It would be a separate paper, but let, just, let me just list some of the um, limits of, um, of uh, Czechoslovak refugee policy. Um, so first of all, um, there was no definition of a refugee or asylum which made it possible for Czechoslovak authorities to give benevolent or, if you want, preferential treatment to a small uh, group of um, uh, people who belong to some kind of political or cultural elite. Um, and then to treat the others less benevolently, uh, which included that Czechoslovakia conceptualized itself as most other states uh, as a temporary refuge. It wouldn't provide uh, uh, labor permits. Um, and especially starting with 1936, um, there, was a, there was growing pressure exerted on uh, refugees um, uh, to limit their political activity and to emigrate to another country. This also included um, the attempt to concentrate the refugees in 1937 in rather distant uh, di and poor districts in the center um, of the country. So that we see that Czechoslovak refugee policy as it evolves uh, from 1933 um, is a mixture of different approaches. It's not, a, it's not anything unified, but that there is, especially starting with 1936, um, a tendency towards more restrictive, uh, restrictive approach. Um, let me now have a look at the process of reframing this refugee policy in the anti-Jewish way and all along ethnic categories. Um, well, as refugees started to cross the Czechoslovak border in 1933, uh, refugees from Nazi Germany, um, the authorities at first didn't explicitly differentiate between Jewish and other refugees, and some of the first instructions even mentioned racial persecution as a legitimate uh, reason to uh, arrive into Czechoslovakia. Um, However, from the very outset, this relative tolerance towards Jewish refugees was dependent on the ability of Jewish organizations to organize further emigration of their clients um, and to fully finance their stay in Czechoslovakia. Um, moreover, um, Czechoslovak officials um, uh, remembering um, the large group of Galician Jewish refugees during and after the First War um, attempted to exclude the so-called Eastern Jews, whatever their definition might be, uh, from the scope of the relative uh, Czechoslovak, um, Czechoslovak um, hospitality. Um, again, we do not have time to discuss the and we have discussed some of it um, yesterday, uh, the treatment of um, uh, Jewish refugees just after the First World War. Um, but let me just refer to um, uh, rather strong anti-Jewish uh, press campaigns, demonstrations, for instance, in Brno or in Ostrava or in other, other cities. And uh, what I would like to mention here is just that not by coincidence, these are events that were taking place just before the signing of the peace treaty, the St. German, uh, German Peace Treaty, uh, so that they're taking place in the context of national insecurity in, in expectation that the borders and citizenship of the new nation states uh, will be defined, will be set up. So in 1919, the exclusion of Jewish refugees fulfilled the, uh, the function of separation from the Habsburg state under whose protection such refugees stood during the First World War, uh, rather than to draw a dividing line between the inhabitants on the territory of the new uh, Czechoslovak state, like the native inhabitants. Um, now coming back to 1930s, um, by, already by mid-1930s, Czechoslovak authorities started to silently alter the policy towards Jews coming from Germany, and as a consequence, Jews were increasingly excluded from the category of refugees seeking protection and were considered uh, economic migrants. Um, this shift was a reaction to the introduction of the Nuremberg Laws um, and the restrictions on immigration to Palestine. Um, uh, in 1936, both the Minister of Interior and the Minister of Foreign Affairs advised their uh, subordinated authorities to apply a very strict policy towards Jewish migrants, as they call it, migrants in quotation marks, um, including those with German citizenship, which was a novelty. Um, the shift was a reaction um, to Jews being turned into second-class citizens in Germany, but it also 
indicated um, a broader phenomenon of erosion of minority protection and citizenship in East Central Europe in the second half of the 1930s. And I would argue that as a result of this process, local, or in quotation marks, Western or assimilated Jews were unofficially but increasingly categorized and treated as Eastern Jews who were supposed to be, uh, to be excluded. Um, this anti-Jewish turn in Czechoslovak refugee policy culminated in 1938 in the closure um, of the border to Jewish refugees from Romania, from Austria, and as we have seen after the Munich Agreement from Sudetenland. Um, during the spring and summer of 1938, uh, Czechoslovak border officials and the police were very busy hunting refugees from Austria, especially in southern Moravia, which as we have already seen was very close to Vienna and the border was technically easy to cross. Uh, probably uh, some 10,000 cases of refugees being turned back can be calculated from the rather insufficient archival evidence. Um, Jews with Polish citizenship um, who were coming to the Czechoslovak border or who were forcibly brought across this border by Austrian police and by the SA, where th those Jews were escorted by Czechoslovak police to the Polish border. And this connects to what Alina reported uh, about and the, um, and the Polish revision of citizenship as enacted in March 1938. Um, it is important to, to understand that Czechoslovak response, at least at the beginning, was not initially caused by the real influx of foreigners. It was rather guided by generalizations and fears of Jewish immigration, uh, because Czechoslovakia had already closed its border uh, with Romania uh, in January 1938 in reaction to news about uh, the new anti-Semitic policy in the country, um, although almost no refugees were arriving into Czechoslovakia uh, by this point. Before and after the Munich Agreement and after the Kristallnacht, um, uh, which followed just several weeks after the annexation of Sudetenland, most of the approximately 28,000 Jews uh, living there either escaped or were expelled into the interior of the country. Um, it's rather difficult for me um, to differentiate here between uh, the, the categories of refugees and deportees in many ways. I think these two categories are increasingly um, merged uh, together. The Nazi census of May 1939 counted only some 2,000 Jews in Sudetenland, most of them people living in so-called mixed marriages or coming from mixed, uh, mixed families. Um, Czechoslovak authorities concerned with the influx of Jews and also of Germans um, in many cases attempted to stop them at the border and to turn them back. And after the Kristallnacht um, on November uh, 11, 1938, the Ministry of Interior issued a strict instruction to return Sudeten Jews. Uh, those people without the Heimatrecht, the right of domicile in the interior of the small Czechoslovakia. Um, The Czech policemen guarding the new border routinely refused to let these Jewish refugees um, into, the, into, the, into the country. Um, and that's why a lot of them had to linger in the physical no man's land. Um, now, the, this no man's land, as shocking and dehumanizing this experience was, um, had eventually lost a less long-term impact because most people would eventually get into the country's interior. It would have less impact than the figurative no man's land. Um, uh, and its legal expression was the Czechoslovak revision of citizenship, or if you want the denaturalization of Jewish refugees. Um, and this is a case which is uh, not very well known, and that's why I'd like to devote um, a little bit of my time uh, uh, to this particular uh, government decree. Uh, issued by the Czechoslovak government on January 27, 1939, uh, officially called um, Decree on the Revision of Czechoslovak Citizenship of Certain Persons. 
Um, it was a part of a package of anti-Jewish plans um, that was drafted by the government of the so-called Second Republic. On the same day, a decree was issued about the residence of emigrants, which uh, was ordering these emigrants to, uh, to leave the country um, uh, rather quickly. Um, um, the, the Czechoslovak revision of citizenship um, has to be seen in the context of other similar measures, uh, which I can't analyze in this short conference paper, and I'd like to do this elsewhere, but let me just refer to the 1933 German law, uh, about which Dieter Gosewinkel uh, uh, published widely, uh, or to the Romanian revision of citizenship from January 1938, the Polish one, which we've already mentioned, or for instance, the one in uh, Vichy, France. Um, and this list certainly can uh, be uh, can be extended. The Czechoslovak decree ordered revision of citizenship of two groups of people. Uh, first, those who were naturalized or who obtained citizenship uh, through marriage after the creation of independent Czechoslovakia in 1918. And second, those who by January 1st, 1938 or later resided in a community on the territory which was ceded to the neighboring countries, Germany, but also Hungary. Um, adding to the confusion um, which accompanied this decree, um, so these people had to themselves categorized, uh, had to categorize themselves and register um, under a rather tough uh, deadline until April 30. Um, and failure to register would result in automatic revision, rev uh, revocation of citizenship. Um, I find it rather interesting that these people had to know themselves that they are considered uh, foreigners and um, have to apply for this. Um, why this law was written in a general language, um, the shift towards an ethnic understanding of citizenship and its anti-Jewish bias was um, rather apparent. And I could support this by some documentation, but for the lack of time, I'll skip this uh, short part. Um, as a result of this uh, of this um, uh, revision of citizenship, um, Czechoslovak authorities routinely revoked um, uh, the nationality of refugees, um, uh, Sudeten Jewish refugees who made it into the interior of the country. And we're talking about, uh, um, about thousands of people, uh, up to possibly some 20,000 people um, who, um, who were uh, who were now living in Prague in, um, and in another, another places. <clears throat> now, in the remaining time, which I have, something like five minutes, uh, uh, um, um, I'd, like to, I'd like to make a couple of comments about, um, about uh, this particular process. First of all, I'd like to, uh, to, um, to, to provide a couple of thoughts about the connection to the uh, territorial revisions um, and the large-scale denaturalizations. Um, um, uh, and I think it becomes clearer with view to the post-First World War construction of citizenship um, in the process of carving out nation states out of the space of the multi-ethnic Habsburg um, Empire. And we often tend to think about uh, this process as uh, something which was based on ethnic categories. Uh, however, the core uh, rules of attribution of citizenship uh, as outlined in the peace treaties followed territory rather than ethno-nation. Uh, so the, the states basically inherited uh, whoever lived uh, before the First World War typically um, on, the, on, on their territory. There was an ethnic corrective to this um, um, in the widely recognized right of optation that has been mentioned uh, before as well, um, which included um, some kind of ethnic, linguistic or racial, uh, racial parameters. Um, uh, these ethnic parameters and ethnic loyalties played an important role in the administration of naturalizations in the interwar period and created a certain tension between these territorial foundations of citizenship and the nationalist practice of naturalization, but on the whole had a very limited effect on the body of citizens, um, um, which stayed roughly, roughly the same. However, um, in 1938, the shifting borders didn't equal to 
just transfer of citizenship of populations, uh, populations living in the affected regions, but it was a process which redefined the very foundations of formal citizenship. So the, the, this time, the change of territory um, destabilized the whole system, and territory uh, was losing value as the defining factor of uh, former uh, formal citizenship. Um, there was a uh, the, the, the denaturalization decree was probably seen as a quick fix to the imperfections of the right to opt, as agreed between Germany and Czechoslovakia after the Munich um, Agreement. Um, this uh, optation treaty uh, looked like the post-First World War treaties, but was different in many ways. First of all, uh, it was not voluntary um, at all. Um, and second, um, it included the, there was, a, there was a discrepancy between the Nazi uh, racial understanding of nation, which excluded Jews from the German nation and the Czechoslovak one. And it also stated that um, those who were not uh, of German nationality um, were allowed to opt for Czechoslovak citizenship. Um, so to provide a couple of comments to uh, conclude with, um, um, I'd like to highlight that um, in both the Polish as well as in the Czechoslovak cases, um, uh, it was the refugees um, who were citizens of the country, Poles or Czechoslovaks, although they were considered foreign based on ethnic categorization and nationalization politics, that uh, that it was these refugees and their uh, coming into the country, into the interior or back to Poland, that triggered the very change of the rules of uh, rules of citizenship towards an ethnic understanding of citizenship. And I believe that this is a this is a process which um, has long term impact um, in how citizenship was understood and impact not only on Jews, uh, but also non-Jews, and I can only briefly refer to the uh, denaturalization. Uh, I'm skipping the, the nationality politics in the protectorate Bohemia and Moravia, um, um, which would be a topic in its own right, but I can only refer to the uh, denaturalization and expulsion of Germans from post-war Czechoslovakia or, um, or from, uh, from uh, Poland. This um, shift towards ethnic understanding of citizenship was very clear in the policies of the post-war, post-Munich uh, Czechoslovakia, where, uh, for instance, the Institute for Refugee Welf Welfare um, uh, um, applied different policies to Jewish and non-Jewish uh, refugees, whereas Czechs were supposed to be integrated uh, Jews, but also Germans were supposed to be emigrated. And we can see in both uh, Czechoslovak and Polish cases that the state by this time is trying to uh, shape the, uh, a, an ethnically homogeneous body of citizens or inhabitants uh, by uh, uh, framing its, um, uh, its emigration uh, policies. Um, so there is this connection between refugee policy and and I'm fin finishing soon, uh, between this refugee policy um, and, um, uh, and the changes to, um, to citizenship. And also, um, I think um, it, uh, it is an impetus for us to rethink um, uh, the relationship between, um, between refugee policies and the Holocaust. This has been often mentioned as a process or parallel between um, uh, the technique of emigration and um, deportation, but I think, but the changes to citizenship were uh, were not very often uh, very often reflected um, reflected upon. Um, if we had time, which we don't have to, uh, don't have, um, we could also look at the at the way how the uh, uh, Czechoslovak denaturalization law was uh, eventually abolished under the Nazi pressure, but uh, in the first year of occupation, but also on the fact that by the time um, the law was abolished, um, um, the fact that these people were eventually recognized as the citizens of the protectorate made no difference, because while they had the formal citizenship, the real content in terms of rights uh, was no more there. Thank you very much.
Thanks, Michael, for the really interesting uh, paper. Thanks also for almost staying right in time. Um, so I would ask you to hold your horses now with questions. Uh, let's uh, have a break now for some minutes, for 10 minutes, and then we'll continue also because a colleague has to uh, leave at a certain point and uh, catch a plane. So let's meet again in 10 minutes, have the two others, and then we are open uh, for questions still.